Imo, welcome to the Personal Best Podcast. I'm happy to be here. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, so good, thank you. It's been a crazy few weeks, um, but yeah, it's been it's been good. Well, I'm very excited to have you here because I know that we've had to reschedule as well, so yeah, <laughs> it's going to be good. So yeah. um, first of all, can you just give us a little personal introduction, um, tell people where you're from, what do you do, that kind of thing? So I'm Imo. <laughs> I am originally from the South Coast, so um, literally in a coastal village right by the sea. So like all my running started there, like along the seafront. <laughs> and then I moved to London, like oh, it's going to be like six years ago now. Um, and that was for uni. So I was at London College of Fashion. That was like a bit of a whirlwind as well. Like I didn't think that I'd get into that uni. Um, I didn't even look at that uni and then I got in because my like direction at the time was I want to do fashion design because um, oh, really? I've got yeah I've got a creative background I was like I want to do this um, I almost didn't apply for the uni because I was like that's the top it was the top it's the top uni in fashion at, well, at the time it was yeah. so I was like oh I'm not even going to apply because I won't get in and then I applied didn't look at it and they were like you've got an unconditional place. And I was like, no way. what? So I was like, literally 19 years old, pack everything up, move to London. I and mean, that's quite a big move from it was, a little yeah, coastal town. Yeah, it was a big move. And it was just like, it was just like, just do it. Like you, you, you've got the opportunity, go and do it. And it, weirdly enough, my mum was the same at the same age. Like, yeah. And it's so weird how you follow the footsteps sometimes of your parents. Um, but yeah, I remember, I was talking about it today. I, was, I remember one of my first like p like times in London. I was I was literally nineteen. I went on a night out, and we were like getting an Uber back, and we were going like past um, the the London Eye. It's got such a like strong memory of it, and being like, this is so surreal. Like this is my life. Now. And now it's like six years later, and I'm just like here. But don't do fashion design anymore. I moved away from it. Um, I now work in sales for an actual energy drink company. So I work very much so like in the health and fitness space. Yeah. And I'm doing something that like, I'm selling something I believe in essentially. Nice. Um, I actually fell into a recruitment job <laughs> after uni. Like I got a first from, um, from LCF in fashion design. And then I was applying to all these jobs and I was getting nowhere. Uh, the fashion industry is like super cutthroat, really competitive. Yeah. And I was like, I don't, I had this like feeling in my gut. I was like, I just don't know if it's for me. Like, I don't know if this culture is my vibe. Like, I just don't know if I, if I want to do it. Like I'm still, and it's weird because now I'm doing all this creativity outside of, let's say like my job, my nine to five. Uh, and I'm utilizing what I did back then. Uh, but yeah, like <laughs> I've gone on a tangent, but like I said, when I was, I, I just took the first job that I could get basically because I wanted to stay in London. Yeah. Um, but that was an internal recruitment job for medical technology, which is completely different. Um, and I mean, I had a bit of a crisis. I was like, what, am I, what the hell am I doing here? Like, this is not where I need to be. But it did teach me, I guess, where I wanted to be. And I actually got made redundant in March. Um, and I thought, oh my God, like it was, I literally hit rock bottom. I was like, what the hell? Like, what am I gonna do? Like, yeah. I'm gonna have to move back home. And I wasn't, as much as I'm close to my family, I was like, I've got to stay here. You like, kind of built a life for yourself in London at that point, yeah, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And I was just like, no, like I've got to stay here. But I was like, I've got to move quick because I've got to pay rent. Like, and I want to be self-sufficient. Like I want to pay for my rent. So I ended up reaching out to this community, like, this running community that I built alongside the studies and then the jobs. Um, I reached out to the people that I was going to run clubs with and I said like, you know, have you got jobs? And then I ended up getting um, this job I have now um, through the connections that I've made. That's and I amazing. turned it around in three weeks and now I'm the happiest I've ever been in my job. Um, yeah. But it just shows you that no matter what hits you in the face it, the hardships the curveballs yeah you're always going to get through it that's exactly what Jenny was saying when she came on this podcast is mm. that 
when you think everything's going wrong in your life and you lose a job or you lose a guy or something, it actually can be putting you onto a different path and mm. maybe a better path. I think it's, I honestly think it's redirection. Mm. Like also I didn't even say I lost my granddad and my job in the same week. Oh, And it was like, you. it was literally like, what the more? The world is against yeah, I was like, me. What more is gonna happen? Like, and that previous to that, like, I had emergency surgery in my final year of university, like, and I was like, what, what the hell? Like, and yeah. it just felt like there was constantly things going wrong and everything wasn't going my way. Like, I was like, I finally got a job. Like, I'm finally happy. Then I've lost it. Then I lost my granddad. And I was like, give me a break. <laughs> like, I was angry. I was just like angry at the world. I was like, for God's sake, like, why? Like, why? Yeah. Are these? But then I think those things happen to just give you a lesson. They're yeah. like, you know, like they test you and then you come out the other side. It's like, there's light at the end of that tunnel. Like there always will be and you'll get through so it. So true. I saw a post recently um, of a guy who'd been through a difficult journey with his health. And he used to always say like, why me? Why yeah. has this happened to me? And then he mm. had to reframe that as to what is life trying to teach me? And mm. it's really hard. Like, mm. obviously you might only realize that in hindsight, but those things do test you and hopefully will make you a stronger person. A hundred percent. Like, and, and, and I've had friends now lose their jobs mm. or be broken up with like five years down the line. Like I've had, yeah. So, I mean, we all go through things like losing family. Like there's, you know, there's nothing like it, but it, it's never, obviously it's never, that's never going to change. Like it's, it's horrific, mm. but it does show you how strong you are. And I think that's what I always come back to is like, if I can get through this, I can get through anything. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that those things are just lessons. Um, so I did want to ask you a bit about your fitness journey because I feel like that's what you've built your page around. Mm -hmm. So give me a little bit of the backstory. How did you first get into fitness? So it's a very long journey yeah there are two like i'd say there's two coin edges or coin faces to it so initially it was i was very very bullied at school for being overweight and looking back i was just like it was just puppy fat i wasn't i wasn't over i wasn't that overweight it was just puppy fat but i remember at the time being so insecure and i, I just I just was so unhappy with the way that I looked yeah. in every sense. But obviously if you keep coming in and you keep getting told that you're not beautiful or told that you're fat or told that you're not good enough, it will set that, it will set that in your mind that you're not good enough. So initially it was, I want to get fit and I want to get healthy. Um, to prove to myself, I guess, but I was so young at the time, I think it was to, to look to look pretty for other people rather than what it is now like now it's for myself i mm. only compete with myself but at that time it was to prove to other people what i could achieve yeah and i guess as well your mindset at the time was probably that if you lost weight or looked different then people would like you more and accept you and accept you and think that you were pretty and and that's kind of awful to mm -hmm. think that way but you're a very you know young impressionable person at that mm. stage of life and what's crazy is when I did lose the weight and I got the ignition of oh like I didn't even recognize you like you look like this like I must have been about 13 or 14 at the time like I didn't even recognize you you look so different like da -da -da. like it was over one summer I remember everyone was like so shocked and that like gratification of being accepted was like okay how far can I push this like mm. I'm accepted now that then set a premise to probably keep small yeah and get smaller yeah. which I think a lot of women face when they're younger um with the social media and just like that whole tumblr era where it was the thigh gap. I remember yeah. we all compared thigh gaps yeah. and like. 
I remember being in the girls' PE changing rooms and we were going around saying who has a thigh gap and who doesn't. We would all stand there with our legs Isn't together. Isn't that just so weird? It honestly, like, it breaks my heart. Yeah. And I really do think that it is changing. Yeah. But we don't know, like, what what is going on because we have the TikTok now mm. and there are, I, have, I still see TikToks that are really dangerous and damaging. Mm. And that's why, like... I try and do what I do on my social media and that's to empower women and encourage women to be strong rather than to be skinny and yeah. want to be their smaller self because I guess I've come out the other side of it. Um, but it, it's just, yeah, it's it's a horrible place, I think. And a lot of women in some time in their life will go through a period of disordered eating in a small sense or a bigger sense. Like, I mean, I, I grew up with even the mums yo-yo dieting yeah. and that feeds into what how you behave because mm. it's like oh that's how you that's how you lose weight lose fat but fat loss is so much easier than that it doesn't need to be yo-yo diet it's hard but it doesn't need to be yo-yo dieting like we can do it in a way where you eat chocolate like you eat your favorite foods you eat pizza it's just calorie deficit but it's crazy that back then that is that is the way that we saw weight loss and it was just damaging for us at the time. So I guess like that was then what set me to disorderly eat on and off for about six to seven years. Really? Yeah. During your like teenage years? During like, I'd say from the age of, I think coming out of losing the weight initially, it went straight into, okay, like, how far can I push this? Like, how little can I eat? Because I need to withhold this body that people can accept in society. Um, so it was probably from the age of 13 to 14 until, like, on and off. Like, there's the thing called, like, quasi-recovery. Uh, when you have an eating disorder, there's a thing called, like, you slightly recover, but you don't fully recover. It was very much so... I would recover and be a healthy weight, but if I went for a bad patch, I would go back to restricting and control. And I'd have periods where I'd get underweight and come back, but I'd say truly until three years ago, I actually mentally got through it and got over it and got past it because I decided I was gonna bulk. And that, when you have to put more food in and watching your strength go up, is the way that I essentially got over the disordered eating because it was like I'm PBing every week. Yeah, like that's crazy. I haven't had this kind of like strength got like this strength improvement in the five years of training in the gym. And that took three months to see massive improvement. And I was just like, I'm I can't I can't believe that I've wa I've wasted this much time. Like this is and it's something just clicked. And I don't like a light bulb I, moment. And I can't even tell you what conversation it was, what made me do it, but it was just like I've had enough. I've had enough of being scared of food. I've had enough of not enjoying food. I've had enough of wanting to be the smallest version. Like I want to be the strongest person mentally and physically. And it was just a light bulb moment. Yeah. Um, and I think what's then led on from that in my fitness space is and now more than ever this year has been, I've got to share this story because there are still people that are going through that and they will continue to go through it until they have that light bulb moment. They have Definitely. to want it. They have to want it enough. Like, yeah. you know, I, I know people in our lives that might still have those issues and it's hard to speak to them about it, but it's like, if you are vulnerable and you tell your story, they might see it and they might connect to it and it might it might help them in some way. Um, and I guess that's that's what I'm trying to do now. Yeah, which I think is so aspirational because <laughs> I know we spoke a little bit about what we were gonna discuss in the podcast and I do think it's such an important topic mm. because I was chatting with a friend recently who had years of eating disorders, disordered eating as well. And I was saying to her like, what is it about young girls in their teenage years and 20s? Like, we can't all have the same defect in our brain that means that we've got this, like, um, vulnerability. 
and I, I just think there's so much that ties into it, you know, whether it is social media or growing up with parents who have been in like have it's, been it's, it's educated differently. Era. Yeah, there's so yeah. much. And then maybe external pressures or pressures at school or comments from boys, like all of this just compounds. And I think we've all not everybody, but a lot of us seem to have gone through a similar journey. Mm -hmm. So your Instagram bio says all things mindset lifting and running. So I was hoping we could kind of delve into those three topics. Mm -hmm. So if we start with the mindset thing, how has your headspace changed around food and training from that girl that wanted to lose weight and wasn't eating enough and wasn't fueling her body to someone who now is doing long distance running and lifting heavy ass weights? Like what changed? Well, first of all, I wanna just say that it's when you have gone through that, it never leaves you. Mm. It is something that you still you still have the thoughts surrounding it, but it's learning to harness those thoughts into something more positive. And that's where the mindset thing comes to. That's so true because I think I wrote a blog post about this that you can't forget how many calories are in no. this I amount can, of food. I can look at um yeah. a handful of rice and I know and what you know are and in you can't it. forget like no. the number on the scales when you used to weigh yourself all the time. Mm -hmm. But you're so right about being able to tune that into something positive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's the thing that sometimes sets people back is, you know, when they when they do have those thoughts, they get into a very negative cycle and it's actually called catastrophizing where you think of the worst case scenario and you think I'm, I'm sinking, I'm, I'm gonna go back to that person. Mm. And it's, you're not, you're not going back to that person because you're, you're, you're who you are now. And you can acknowledge it. Yeah. And, and you, acknowledge the behavior. Exactly. And I think it's letting those thoughts come in and it's, you can't silence them. It's like, okay, you're not a useful thought. Sometimes I literally say to my thoughts, like, and it sounds so silly, I go, you're not useful. <laughs> because if, if you're not useful, like, if, if, it's, if it's not something that's gonna help me, yeah. then why am I thinking it? Yeah. If it's not useful, then I, I, try to, I try to put something more positive in yeah, there. Yeah, and that's that idea of you're not your thoughts. Yeah. Because you can take something and think, no, I'm not gonna listen to that part of my brain. Mm -hmm. And just to interject quickly, I think that is something that's really tricky with eating disorders because when you're in the depths of it, it almost feels like that voice in your head is on your side mm -hmm. and it's working for you. And it's mm -hmm. saying, no, you should eat this and shouldn't eat this and do this exercise because that's how you will be healthy and that's mm -hmm. how you'll be the best version of you. Mm -hmm. It is but the, it's, it's false. It is the, and it's, we all have that inner, I almost think it's like an angel and devil. And we always have that voice or that chatty voice at the back of our head that's like, you're not good enough. You're this, you're that. And it's always there. It's always going to be your self-conscious of telling the you that you're not good. Yeah. And the people that don't have that voice, uh, I salute them. But I think we all do have a negative voice that tells us, that we're not doing well. But the, the one that overrides it and the one that we can get past is, you know, let me take that first step. Like, let me let me use this. Like, you know, if we have, let's say you are still going through the situation of restricting, it's like, I don't know how you get through it. It's 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 hard, but I think thinking like where do I want to be? Like what what are my goals? Like is my goal a marathon? Let's say, let's move it on to running. Like, is my goal a marathon? You're not gonna achieve that marathon if you don't eat. You just won't. And you're not gonna, I mean, you'll do it, but you'll get really injured. And you might be put out of running for a couple of months. And if you want to hit your full potential, you have to fuel yourself. Like marathon training is no joke. And I think it's crazy in the running community because marathons are becoming a little bit more accessible to everyone. Yeah. Whereas it was a bit more like, I started doing it two years ago. It was a bit more like, whoa, like you're doing a marathon. Reserved still, for the like super elite. Yeah, but, but it's still crazy. Like it it's still like such a hard thing to do and everyone gets injured and it's difficult, but when you do a marathon, like everything needs to be working together. Like your nutrition needs to be top. 
Like you need, to, you'll be increasing your calories because if you're going out for a 30K run and you haven't fueled before, your glycogen stores are going to be screaming at you. You're going to run out of energy. Yeah, so it's like, so true. it's harnessing into that like goal that you have, like with anything, like, but if you're, if, if we put it into the example of the marathon, it's like, if I don't eat this meal or I don't have like the good post meal, then one, I'm going to get injured or two, I'm not going to be able to complete that run. And I'm not going to hit my goal of the marathon in the end because I'll probably have to pull out of the marathon, which is, mm. I think that's the whole problem. Yeah, I think you're so it. right. But I think the stage just before that, and I am speaking from my past experiences, you kind of cruise along fine. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? As long as you're not at a critical level where, you know, it, you could be at risk of being hospitalized, which mm -hmm. sadly happens to a lot of people. Like for me, I was underweight, but I could still go to the gym and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so healthy because I'm doing these running clubs and these circuit classes and going to the gym. And, you know, I'd be at sleepovers with friends and not eat the sweets and chocolate and think, oh, but I'm just... I had the same. And people be like, And people wouldn't even offer it to me in the end because they'd yeah. be like... Oh, you're the health, and it'd be like you're really healthy. And yeah, it's like, and that was. Um, but now I look at it. Yeah. If, if somebody that did that around me now, I'd be like, "That's not healthy." Yeah, 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 yeah. That isn't healthy. Exactly, and I think you can kind of stay at that level for quite a long time until someone calls you out. Yeah, and also it's only when you then choose the path to recovery that you realize how much potential you've kind of missed off. If that makes sense, like. Mm -hmm as soon as I started fueling myself and gaining a bit of weight, I had so much more energy. Yeah. And I could lift more and I could run faster. And yeah. It's so tricky And it though. goes back to, it's almost going through that recovery proof to you, like what you've been missing. And I've been going through kind of something even a little bit bigger now, like, and I've spoken about it on my Instagram page, but I want to talk about it now. Yeah. Is... I've been recovered for three years. Like I am the healthiest and the fittest I have ever been in my whole life. Mm. But because of the way that I malnourished my body for that many years, I'm essentially handicapped in some way because I'm not, because I malnourished my body for that long, it's, it's still recovering off that. Right. And I sat down, so I'm training for my fourth marathon. Um, my body's become conditioned to it. I feel like, you know, I was I was on for a personal best. And I sat down with my coach and my physio and they were like, you know, you're training a lot. Like, have you ever considered like, you know, you are set to get a stress fracture because of your history. Like you're having a few niggles. Like we've got to be careful with these niggles because, you know, for one, women are more, ten they, more they tend more to have um lower bone density so the men um and then if you put someone in the situation who has had any an, an eating disorder mm. they are even more high risk of a stress fracture and this is something that i don't see talked about what is a stress fracture a stress exactly. fracture essentially is so i've got a grade three stress fracture not stress fracture grade three tibial stress on both sides so it's essentially say if you had shin splints yeah that'd probably be a I mean, I might butcher it, but it might be like a grade one, grade two. A stress fracture is a grade four. So I've got to the point where in my training, I've trained so hard and I've learned to ignore the pain that I've missed the signs of an injury. Mm. And that's, that's the issue with marathon training is sometimes you learn to ignore the pain. But you, what I'm learning now is you cannot ignore the pain in training. Yes, in the race, you have to tap out the pain. Yeah. But in training, you have to lean into those. If you have a niggle, you have to stop. Yeah. And it's been a bit of a reflective period of like, okay, I didn't realize, for one, I didn't realize that my past will still haunt me a little bit in my endurance training. Uh, and I'm slightly handicapped for that. But I didn't realize that, you know, like, for instance, like all this stuff about women's health that, you know, we're trying to keep up with, you know, the men, which is great, but our cycles can affect the way that we train. Yeah. And like, you know, like you're more set to get an injury 
a week before your cycle, which is just really crazy. Yeah, there's like there's so many statistics about it. It's something that I'm learning about now in women's health. It's like you have to. We, we, I know we're learning that you need to like kind of work with your cycle because it could end up, you know, harming you in injury. Um, yeah. Which is amazing in the space because I think women's health is being more spoken about, you know, where the history of women's health research is 6% of sports research in women. It's 6% of like the whole sports science. It's really? only exclusively on women. So all of the other research has is been on men, on men and then just put onto a woman's body. And it's like, our bodies are so, so different. different. I listened to um, a podcast on the exact topic. I think it was the Not So Fit Couple podcast of Lucy Davis. Yeah, I love that. And um, I think, yeah, it was titled like Women Are Not Mini Men. Yeah. And like, take Lucy Davis, for example, she's an insane athlete, yeah. but is still a woman who has a period and has to mm -hmm. work around that. And mm -hmm. it does feel like it gets left out of the conversation a little bit. Mm -hmm. It does. And I think, for instance, I went to this women's event uh, yesterday uh, evening and it was five women who took on this challenge um, and it was all centered around like Garmin safety and strong women, but they, they opened up the conversation of um, ultra marathon runner, um, I can't remember her name, but it's Sophie. Um, she has a platform called She Races mm. and it's she's a GB ultra marathon runner and essentially they've made this platform where they are trying to change races to suit women because these women are going to ultra marathon runs, 250 kilometer runs. And for instance, like there's only a portaloo with no running water. And what was if a woman is on their period and they don't have the right, like, you know, tools to get them through that in some way. So this whole platform is um, just trying to change some of the race uh, strategies yeah. to be suited more to a woman. Like a woman can race with a man. She can race ag against the man. Like in ultra marathons, like women are beating, like yeah. Courtney is beating men by 10 hours. It's like, I think this, I think the longer the distance, the shorter the time difference between mm. men and women, I think. Yeah, it's really, so it really would, exciting. It would be a shame that something like, tra like doing that race on your period would be the reason that and I held back from a man. And there were conversations last night that, that that has held women back. Yeah. And it has held elite women back that, um, you know, when they're on their period, they have to race. Like, what can they do? I mean, it completely changes. I mean, let, let's say you're an e elite athlete and you have a race and suddenly you're on your period. Like, it's going to change the way that you're, you fuel and your digestion. And it's just, it's just crazy that, you know, this topic is only really coming to light and people are working on the back line, that, but I'm seeing more and more stuff about it now. Like, yeah. and I wanna be at the forefront of that, I guess, and try and champion it because we deserve to be in the same space as men, but we do have different bodies. Yeah, and exactly. Yes, exactly. we can race the men and we can be there at the races, but there needs to be more conversations around these taboo subjects. Yeah, I think you even made an Instagram post about your why. Mm. And I always love asking people this question, like their reasons for doing what they do. And in that you said your why is almost empowering that younger girl who didn't eat enough, cared too much about the way she looked and wanted to be smaller. Mm. And I really feel like you are doing that and that is mm. what your platform does. And even just in this Thank conversation <laughs> today, but what, I guess like now you've kind of gone through that recovery and you spend a lot of time in the running community and with other fitness people. What would your advice be to kind of empower that person? I think it's just believing in yourself. And mm. I know that that's like, I think there's so many things that you can do, but it all comes from, I think when you go through tough times, you don't believe in yourself and you do let that negative voice come in, but it comes back to starting to just stay in your own lane and remember your purpose. Like, you know, like you said, like I've realized off the back of some hard times, I have, I have a story to tell 
but could tell you know it could help someone and make them believe in themselves because I did it like I, I I was eating like that for six seven years and I never saw a way out yeah I, I never did and I never believed in myself and like to be honest with you only until this year I've started believing in myself um and it's crazy um but my platform have has almost like become this safe space for me to open up to people and I find mm. it almost easier to write a, vo a voiceover where I explain kind of what I've been through yeah than to sometimes tell my friends um which is crazy um but I think yeah it comes back to realigning with what you want to achieve in your life um and you don't always need to figure out what your purpose is but I think the tough times actually get you to that purpose. Yeah, that's so true. I, I genuinely yeah. do. Like everything that's happened to me in the space of a year, there's been a lot of lows, mm. but it's realigned me to the direction that I want to be. And I think that is just what I want to show yeah, women. Of course. And I think just the believing in yourself thing is so key and is a really important message, particularly for young women, because I kind of think maybe it's just me but we've been programmed to believe that by being confident and self-assured that we're almost like showing off mm -hmm. or a bit arrogant do you mm. know what I mean whereas mm. men don't really seem to have that same no. complex I, I find that so interesting because I was honestly thinking about this the other day it was like when men achieve things I, I don't know if it's women to women uh and I, I don't know, but I think men seem to be more self-assured. Yeah. And I think that's great. Like, I'm so happy that they are. But I want, I think women, with the way that we, you know, we, we talk, we just can be a bit more negative. Definitely. And we are, a lot of us are perfectionists, especially in the fitness space, especially in the running space. A lot of us want that perfect race. We want that perfect um training like we you know mm. and then we get really upset when it doesn't go to plan yeah whereas I, I don't know just from guys that I know and have spent time with they seem to just throw themselves in the deep end and just see what happens and maybe I think there's psychology behind that maybe it's they are more fearless mm. and we're more feel fearful yeah and you know there's so many things that come into that in terms of like feeling safe yeah like you know, like, this is like what I was talking in that event yesterday, like, you know, a lot of us women, you know, we go, we don't want to run in the dark because we're worried about somebody that's, say, following us or walking back from work in the dark because we've heard about situations. Like, I think there's a lot of, like, reason for us to be fearful because, you know, on the daily we get catcalled um, and there are men that perhaps make us feel scared. Um I think there is a lot behind that. It's like we are maybe conditioned to be a bit more fearful. But what I want to show women is there is so much. One, there's strength and vulnerability. You yeah. don't have to be confident all the time because I'm a confident, loud, outgoing person. But I'm incredibly deep. Mm. And like I said sensitive to my friend and she said realign that because you're not sensitive. You're just very empathetic yeah which um, is a good way which to is be. a good way to be um but I think it's I think there's this misconception like you said where if you're confident you're showing off but it's like no like being confident is proving to yourself that you're worthy of Definitely. the things that are coming to you and I've had to readjust that recently because I am trying to do this podcast and mm -hmm. and grow it and I, I yeah. love it and you get imposter syndrome sometimes. yeah and I kind of downplay it and be like oh it's just like a fun thing on the side whereas now I'm like no I I really am putting my time and energy into this and mm -hmm. the same with the gym I might say oh it's just a bit of a hobby where I was like no it's like a part of my life and I love to be strong and I love to be fit and yeah. own that and it's the same when people will say like oh I don't really run and it's like, if you go for a run, you're a runner. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it, it doesn't have to be. I think that's the thing as well is in the running community, it's like, I love being in this space. I think it's everyone who has got into running seems to have had some turning point in their life. They've turned to running as therapy, mm. um, which I think is incredible. 
But I think we always have to realign to why we're doing it. Yeah, definitely. And we're doing it, you know, not always to get the personal bests, to sometimes just feel good in the moment. Yeah. And, you know, I'm realigning like I've pulled out of my marathon uh, because I'm injured, because I care more about my health like what I said, like I care more about my health and I've got a, I've got a lifetime to run those marathons. Like, and I think that's, that's the thing. It's like changing the why from just, yeah. I want to do the fourth marathon to yeah. I'm looking after my health. Yeah. Which is, it is great. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's a catch 22, isn't it? It's like, it's great when we're achieving so many things, but also like learning to rest and re mm. learning to realign with yourself and sit with, just, you know, going, not doing the most you can do is sometimes the most productive thing you can do. Like rest can be the most productive yeah. thing you can do. And you sometimes have to look at, tra like you have to look at rest as part of the training. Mm. And I think that sometimes in the running world, it can get lost. Like. Definitely. Because I was even thinking to myself, because I've seen your content around getting injured and, and having to pull out of the marathon, which is a real shame. But, you know, if I... I feel like if most people were told by the doctors like you can't run, like you have to rest, they'd be like, oh, great. You know, to be honest with you, like I wasn't even told you can't do it. Yeah. It was as soon as I knew that it could be something that was connected to my path, I decided. Yeah, fair enough. But a lot of people, I've done marathons injured and a lot of people in the running community have still pushed through right. and run them injured and then being put out. And I was like, I care too much about this sport to be put out longer than I need to be. It's like, okay, I pull out of one race, but in the grand scheme of things, if that means that I'm a stronger person because of it, great. Yeah, for sure. And I think you have to realign with the goals. It's like, and I, I get it. If you're running your first marathon, you've, you've got one little niggle and you want to just push past that race. I get it. But if it's something more sinister, than it just being a small niggle and it's an injury that has reoccurred, you have to realign with yourself and be like, what am I running this race for? Am I running this race to prove that I can run this PB or show everyone that I can do it? Am I running this race to prove to myself what mm. I can achieve? And why is running such a big part of your life? I mean, you've done three marathons, that's huge. Like, what is it about the sport that you enjoy? Because some people listening might hate running, yeah, you know? Yeah, of course. And, like, I come from a, a kind of... I lo I've always loved strength training, and I will continue to do that as well. But I think, obviously, running has become a focal point. Yeah. Um, It's just a place where... And I don't know, because I always say this to people, like, the endorphins I get from a run is so different to what I get from the gym. And I think it comes back to... One, you're outside, um, obviously, if you're, if you're outside, not in the treadmill, and you're on a journey. And I think every run is a journey, so from A to B. And you feel, you might feel really bad on a run. Like, there are a lot of runs. They say there's the rule of thirds. So in running, you have run, we have, you know, in the, in the thirds, the, the first third is, it's going to feel really good. The second third is it's not going to feel that great and then you know it feels okay and the third it feels awful yeah so and that can happen in a week and that can literally happen in a week <laughs> let alone training yeah so it's like and it comes back to you can get through all of those r rubbish runs let's say in training and then you get to that marathon point or that r even if it's a 10k and you get yourself injury free or just to the start line, it's like, I've gone on this journey, like like what you do on one run. Yeah. And then when you get to the end of that run, it's like a huge wave of endorphins and like, just like a self of achievement. Um, and obviously we, we all talk about runners high, but it's, it's just so much more than a sport. It's just like, it's, yeah. I don't even know how yeah. to explain the No, feeling. I mean, even now I'm like, encouraged to put my training on and go <laughs> for a run but how are you now balancing I mean without the injury how are you balancing lifting and running and I ask that 
a bit selfishly because I used to be quite a good runner. Mm -hmm. But when I did endurance athletics, apart from a little bit of resistance training with the club, I didn't do any weights. Mm -hmm. Whereas in recent years, I've strictly done like weight training and strength training. And I'm looking to kind of now combine the two. Mm. So how do you balance both? You know what it is? So it's so interesting because I've been in that situation where I didn't know how to balance. I didn't, I really didn't know. And mm. it's, I've learned how to balance along the way. For, for instance, when I was training for my first marathon, I was running three days a week and then gymming three or four times a week. So that was a weird a split as well. for someone who was training for a marathon. Yeah. Um, but again, like I was a novice to the, to the marathon so I didn't really understand um and now having run two more it's like when you when you have strength training and running I guess you have to look at what's what's the goal at the end if you've got more of a focus on I want to hit a PB in the gym then your training should be more aligned to that so you know you'll be doing more heavy stuff to hit let's say let's say a 100 kg squat yeah. You'll be doing more stuff to align with that. Yeah. Uh, and you might be doing easier running, mm. let's say. Because if you're doing loads of speed work on your legs, you're going to have fatigued legs and you're not yeah. going to hit those numbers. And that's something um, Ree said, who's obviously been on the podcast, is that she was mm -hmm. trying to run for, a, train for a marathon and trying to hit a PB. Of and like, I've done the same. And and she did yeah. get injured and, and it's really tricky. Yeah. And, you and I've done the do same. You do everything. Yeah. And I've done the same where... I was hitting crazy numbers in the gym, which is impressive, but I was also training for a marathon. Like we, we all do it because we're, we're perfectionists and we're <laughs> you know, <laughs> overachievers um, and we do do it, but it's like, you have to sit back, look at your training and think, what is my main goal out of this? Have I got a time that I want? Or is it just finishing the race? Um, because that is still really impressive. Like I, I think, I think, you know, realigning and just being able to get through the race, if it's the first race, is an amazing thing to achieve. But it's, I guess the way that I balance it is I found doing more of a full body split works with four running days, yeah. um, like a couple of full body, full body days, um, which, you know, if, if you're only getting, being able to get to the gym two or three times a week is a better split rather than doing solely legs, solely upper body. It just, it works, it works for me. It might not work for someone else, but I do think that that's a better way to look at it. And if I was to, uh, you know, I'm training to be a personal trainer. So if I was to be coaching someone and they were, they wanted to run four times a week and they also wanted a gym two or three times a week, I would be like, you got to do full body. Um, that would just work better because you're not putting loads of let work, um, you're not putting loads of load on your legs. Yeah, um, sure. But I've only really figured that out, uh, you know, going into like the second marathon training block. Um, but I found that that's worked. And I think the reason a lot of runners do get injured is because they lack the strength training. The strength mm. training is like something that's so useful in not getting injured. Definitely. Um, it's, you know, keeping that body strong and like ready for those runs but also not butchering your legs so that they're really fatigued on that run because that is when you do get injury yeah you don't want to be running on fatigued legs it's like the two can either go hand in hand and complement each other beautifully and mm -hmm. and help your training or they can kind of hinder each other and really work against each other yeah mm. so I don't know maybe finding a good plan I know that Holly B fitness um has plans on the strong girl society mm -hmm. if anyone's listening they're really good to check out mm -hmm. so you've obviously been on quite a whirlwind of a fitness <laughs> journey and a career journey by <laughs> the sounds of it but what's next for you what are your goals if you're willing to share any <laughs> yeah so obviously i'm seeing where this goes um I love, I actually love my nine to six. Um, it's, it's great for me. And I loved doing this, you know, this is a side hustle that is becoming great. Yeah. But my, my whole goal, I guess, is to keep empowering women in the spaces that I can. Um, you know, I have a reach in the community, running communities, um, 
I'm a run club leader at a couple of run clubs. Um, I'm set to set up my own run club. It's, you know, like having those conversations, opening up the taboo subjects, um, reaching out to people and just being that listener. And I actually changed my bio, interesting enough, to the hybrid hybrid the hi- the hybrid hype girl because i want to be the hybrid comes into i've rediscovered a love for swimming and cycling yeah. so that is going to come into it um obviously with the gym training and the running um that is kind of a message as well to show you that you can achieve anything mm. you don't need to be in one box yeah so you can't true. be doing a few things at once um you know, like, and, and I think that's really powerful. Um, but it, again, it's just to keep sharing the message, keep learning more about women's health, um, getting qualified so I can coach women to do the same thing that I've done. Um, and just, I guess, keep, keep going where we, where we're going. Um, I, I never like to set to what I used to do in my life is set my five-year goal plan and yeah. I, I was so set on what my job would look like and look like I've come out and I've done every single job under the sun and I still don't know yeah um but I think there's beauty in not knowing so true I can relate to that so much like <clears throat> I made a post on my 23rd birthday that three years ago on my 20th birthday I just had a meeting with a life coach because I didn't know what I wanted to do but mm-hmm. I was I was 20 mm-hmm. in the depths we of lockdown yeah. and I was thinking to myself, I need to know exactly what degree I'm going to do and then I need to know what job I'm going to apply for. And I I felt the need to have it all planned out. Whereas now I realise that if the end goal was always certain and it was a given, then you lose all the mystery and the excitement and the lessons along the way. Yeah. Like, I think it's hard. I think it's hard coming out of university. I think it's hard picking a degree. I think it's hard coming out of university. And I always thought that there was like a right and wrong option, you know? Of course. But there is not set in stone. Like, there's never, because every path is so different and we're Mm. all doing different things. And yes, there are people that, you know, that, you know, they're studying to be a doctor and they, they know their paths and they're amazing people. Great. Yeah. Um, but you know, for the rest of us that still don't have a fi- it figured out, yeah. there, I guess that 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 be my advice is just live in the present and go with it because as soon as I let go of the control, things have started happening that I couldn't. The person back that was restricting and didn't believe in herself would never ever expect to be the person she is here. Yeah. Um, it's and then that's just come from taking the leap and not not knowing what the next few years will look like but, but just believing in yourself along the way again I guess. yeah believing in yourself and just being stay assured that you know staying in your lane is going to get you to where you need to be mm, definitely so just to round this up my last question to every guest is if you had to give a piece of advice or a quote or a mantra to help people achieve their personal best what would it be I think if anyone follows me I on feel my like Instagram, I already know what it's gonna be. <laughs> if anyone follows me on their Instagram they'll know because I talk about it all the time for every single hard thing that's happened to me over the space of a year I've gone back to the comeback is always greater than the setback. So no matter what, if you have something that, you know, awful happened to you, that however big or small that setback is, if you harness it, the comeback would be greater and it will be better and it will be bigger. Um, and it, I just think that it, it gets you through those rough times. Yeah. It's something that I always, it's like the same thing as there's light at the end of the tunnel, like you will get through it. And that is just a really good way to ref- reframe the, why is it happening to me? It's like, this is happening to you because the comeback is going to be greater. Yeah, it's something similar to what Hercules said on the podcast is you will get through this. And he said, mm-hmm. 
if you're here now, you have a 100% success rate of getting through all the hard things that have ever happened to you. Exactly. By virtue of you still being here mm -hmm. and pushing forward. And I think that chimes in so beautifully with all the conversations I've already had with inspiring people. Like all of them have faced setbacks, whether it be not getting into the university they wanted or getting broken up with or going through disordered eating or mm. having grief in the family. Mm. All of these things are shit. But if you harness them mm. and you learn the lessons from them, it can turn into something amazing. And that is genuinely life. Like if yeah. you go through your life expecting it to flatline and just be good all the time or just be okay, then you're not going to experience what life is. And life is fully it's full of the ebbs and the flows and you have to go with it definitely amazing so where can people go if they want to find you or anything so, you're doing yeah it's pretty much similar across um tiktok and instagram it's image and x fit um it's been like that for a while uh and i feel like i can't get rid of it but um yeah it's the same across the platforms um but yeah keep an eye out because um, I'm going to be doing a run club called um, Mindset Mondays nice. coming up very, very soon. Um, just so we can harness um, setting our weeks up for success, essentially. That's great, actually, because a lot of them I see are on Saturday mornings, which I also love. But, you know, I feel like a Monday is a really good way to start. Well, essentially, I always find that I have all these running and fun things on a weekend <laughs> and I get to a Sunday and I feel a bit like nervous to go into the next week Sunday and scaries. Like Sunday scaries and I get to a Monday and I feel a little bit blue sometimes um and, and interesting enough I put up a poll and something like 80% of people said they they feel blue on a Monday and I was like okay well yeah. let's figure this out like let's have something to look forward to on a Monday nice. um so yeah I want to have a safe space for us to just come together and it be an easy run um just so we can kind of realign our goals for the week. And what are the run clubs that you currently lead as well? So I lead for Pure Sport and Friday Night Lights. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, if you want to come down to them, um, that'd be great. I don't know when this podcast is coming out, but I'm just about to be at a Nike run club as well. Um, so that's super fun. Uh, that's happening on the 1st of November. Um, but yeah, those two have been like a great... Um, a great starting for me and my point for me in my running journey and giving me the confidence to do what I'm doing now. Um, so if you ever feel scared to run on your own, definitely get yourself to a run club. Amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I had the best time.